Welcome back to another video. For those of you that watch the channel, you already know that we're not big on doing collabs and we're certainly not a podcast or interview type of channel. However, today you guys are going to get a video that is very unlike any of the videos on our channel. So apparently a couple weeks ago when we released our new Python species video, our Antaresia video, Mark O'Shea was in the UK at the time doing a book signing event. And he had some people come up to him and asked him if he had seen our video, which he hadn't. When he got home, he checked his email and he had some more messages from people directing his attention to our video. I then received an email from Mark O'Shea himself. He reached out and he wanted to just get together and have a chat, a Zoom chat of some sort. And he just wanted to kind of elaborate more on the geographic history of Papua New Guinea and of course tell me about his experience when he discovered that, that animal. I was super excited. I agreed completely. I wanted to set something up. I was eager to do it. And I asked him if he would allow us to record it and I could put it on my channel. I didn't want that opportunity wasted. I wanted you guys to see it. For those of you that are interested in that species, I wanted you to gain some knowledge from our chat. So that's what you're getting today, you guys. Mark O'Shea. It is an absolute honor to have you on the channel. This is unbelievable and the context behind it is is just amazing. Oh, you're I very you, kind to say so. Thank yes, you. Yes, I, I, I met you once, as you know, about 20 years yeah. ago at an expo. And we didn't really know each other. You were making a guest appearance. Oh, yeah, it, yes. On um, Dana Savarelli's uh, Midwest stand. Yes, correct. If someone would have come up to me and said, in 20 years, you and I would be coming together about something like this. I, I would have said, get out of here. I would have yeah, never believed it. When I was a young herper, if somebody had come up to me and said, well, decade, a few decades from now, you're going to be making a television series that's still going to be remembered two decades after you made it and in a, you know, and respected, I'd have gone, get out of here. Because yeah. that's, that's the strange thing about life. You never really know what's around the corner. We're, 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 we're all the same sort of people, but you know, we just, we never expect it to happen to you, you know, to, yes. and, and I mean, the TV series was amazing. It got me into a lot of places that I couldn't have gone without um, a broadcaster and a production company behind me, both for expense and permissions and everything. Um, so it was tremendous. And, and, you know, it, it helped to build my career, you know, and let's face it, now I'm a professor and an MBE and, you know. It's, Unbelievable. It's, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny the turns that life takes. This is why I always say if you get an opportunity that, that's legal, obviously, but if you get an opportunity to, to change direction or to um, take on a challenge, do it. Because if you don't, you'll spend the rest of your life wondering what would have happened. If, yes. you had, if you had and and you know it's it's all about just making that right decision and you know and luck yes of course of course and and sacrifice and slog and <laughs> blood Definitely. sweat and tears Definitely. yeah yeah, yeah great yeah. advice great advice so we're here to talk about anteresia but uh, you reached out to me and you wanted to kind of set a few things straight. Um, I would be really interested to hear about um, the the, the ge geologic background of PNG and, and all that sort of thing. So you want to kind of explain to yeah, us? Yeah, for sure. Um, you, you were on the right tracks, but it was a little simplistic. You know, yeah. this idea that New Guinea was tagged onto the top of Australia is only part right. And... Um, this morning, I've just prepared a few graphics in Photoshop to be able to explain this. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Um, and and um, there is a map of the island of New Guinea, mm -hmm. the second largest island in the world and the largest tropical island in the world, perched the top of Australia above Queensland and um, Northern Territory. And the eastern half is Papua New Guinea. Um, and the western half is, people use the term Irian Jaya. It hasn't been Irian Jaya since before I started making Big Adventure. 
Right. That name has not been used for decades. Right. It's actually called Papua, which does confuse. You've got Papua on one side of the border, Papua New Guinea on the other side of the border, and the whole island is New Guinea. Sure. And if that's not complicated enough, <laughs> Papua, the Indonesian half, is divided into two provinces. The western one, which is the Bird's Head Peninsula, that's called West Papua, and the big rump of New Guinea up to the Papua New Guinea border is Papua province. So, you, you, you know, there's, there's a great use of the word Papua here, and it isn't helped by the fact that um, Papua New Guinea used to be two separate territories. Um, the, the Indonesian half was Dutch, and Papua New Guinea was, the south was British New Guinea, which became Papua, <laughs> If, hmm. if you're following me, and yes. the northern part was German New Guinea, which they lost in the Treaty of Versailles following the Great War. Okay. So, um, yes, it, I, I can quite understand how people get confused by what is Papua and what is not. But okay. but instead of using Irinjai, we would use Papua or Indonesian New Guinea. And I sometimes use the term West New Guinea because it's obviously the west half of the island. So, sure. so let me find where... Right. Now, um, to the south, we've got these seas. The Banda Sea, um, off to the west, goes down to over 24,000 feet, um, over 7,000 metres. The Coral Sea, um, down to the southeast, is nearly 30,000 feet deep, 9,000 metres. Now, those are the two big seas to the south, but there's another one, and that's the Arafura Sea. And that's only 262 feet deep, um, 80 meters. So it's a shallow, shallow sea. And there's a reason why it's a shallow sea. Um, that is the Gulf of Carpentaria uh, between Queensland and um, Northern Territories. And all that pale area is the Sahel Shelf. Now, people know that Borneo, Sumatra, Java, and the Malaysian Peninsula sit on the Sunda Shelf. And there's a lot of gene flow, or there was a lot of gene flow um, in the past between Borneo, Sumatra, Java to a degree, and, and the Malay Peninsula, and north and south and east and west, because that shelf was above water at one time. And you think about the distribution of blood pythons, and you can see that there's a commonality there. Now, the Sahel Shelf is the same thing, but on the other end of the archipelago, Australia and New Guinea. And this is where this idea that New Guinea is sort of tacked onto the, the north of Australia comes from because um, the Sahel Shelf, um, well, during glacial periods, the sea levels um, were up to 394 feet, well, 400 feet or 120 meters lower than they are today. So if you drop 100, uh, 120 meters, you can see that's dry land, that sure. entire area. Um, of the Arafura Sea would be dry land. It's a continental shelf. And um, where am I going with this next? And so we have this situation, a land bridge existed between Australia and New Guinea for at least 40,000 years over the last 2 million years. Now it's not all been in one go, you know, glacials and interglacials. It, it, every time there's a glacial period, that water in the glaciers has got to come from somewhere and it comes from the oceans. And so the oceans are lower. It's the whole point. This is the whole thing behind the idea of if we melt, melt the Arctic and Antarctica, the sea levels will rise naturally and a lot of places will be flooded. Um, and so this is all about these rising and falling of sea levels. And they do occur naturally, of course. I mean, there's times when Antarctica didn't exist, but the whole planet wouldn't have been very hospitable at that time. So you can see, um, where that connection is. Now, if I go to the next one, this is showing um, the same area, but during a glacial period when the sea levels are lower. And you can see that Southern New Guinea is the part of the landmass with Northern Territories and Cape York Peninsula, Queensland. And that whole um, pale area is the Sahel Shelf. And you might have needed a pair of gumboots to walk across at times, you know, it might have been wet and marshy, but, but it's basically land. And where you've got um, today um, the Gulf of Carpentaria, you had Lake Carpentaria, and it was a freshwater lake. 
and it was fed by rivers from Cape York Peninsula in Queensland, Northern Territories, and the rivers from Southern New Guinea off the Oromo Omo Plateau. They all went into this lake. And, and this is largely known because the fish faunas are pretty similar between that part of Southern New Guinea, um, the Southern Transfly, and Cape York and Northern Territories. There's a lot of mm -hmm. similarity. All the fish are closely related, which they wouldn't be because they're freshwater fish. They wouldn't be if, if there'd always been sea in the way. So, and right. then, then a, a one river will have flowed out of that to the deep water of the Banda Sea um, off, to, off to the west. And if you look, you'll see that the, the Aru Islands um, are actually located on the um, Sahel Shelf as well, um, as well as um, New Guinea and Australia, whereas the Key Islands and Tanimbar Islands, they're, they're, they're off in deep water. So that's the situation there. Now, when you were talking about New Guinea being part of the Australia, it's, what it is, it's, um, it's, it's a craton, a craton, a large chunk of the Earth's crust, often a continent. And um, yes, you were right, but you'd sort of assume that New Guinea was always as New Guinea is now. No, when it was part of this, if you like, the vanguard, the leading edge of the Australian Craton, it's only really what we've got shaded in orange. And you know that this is part of Gondwana land, um, which split up, I mean, South America, Madagascar, the Seychelles is a sun called sunken continent, um, Africa, Antarctica, Australia and India, all part of Gondwana land, all split up and all went their separate ways. And of course, India collided um, with um, Laurasia. Um, well, here we have a similar sort of situation. The Australian Craton is slowly trundling northish and coming, uh, I'll put the cell shelf in, I'll just put in a couple of the, uh, I think we've already covered that, Lake Carpentaria now. now As Australia trundles northish, there are some things called terrains. And terrains are um, crust fragments that are often broken away from larger plates, larger tectonic plates. And these are in the Pacific and in the Philippines. And these are pieces of um, broken off crust that are sort of moving in a southeasterly direction. I mean, no, south southwesterly south southern direction and as they're coming down they're colliding with the craton going north and so where we've got that sort of northern new guinea that's been formed from these terrains coming in so it's not the same geology as southern new guinea it's not got the same origins and the central cordillera there the, the highlands of new guinea well that is what's known as an origin. Origen, orogenesis is mountain building. And the most obvious example is the slow speed car smash of India colliding with Laurasia and creating the, 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 the Himalayas, which are going up. And eventually, like in a, if you slow, if you film two cars running into each other with, with, and, and slowed it down phenomenally, you'd see them hit and you'd see them bounce up and you'd see the hoods rise up and you'd see them crumple together but eventually they're going to probably because of gravity drop away again well that's this slow speed collision when and you can see these mountain ranges in the middles of quite a few places like madagascar and things like that and and you often think what well, is that caused by plates colliding or something like that and in the case of india and laurasia it is and here in new guinea this was what forms those those cordilleras so um, now I'll just mark in the other peninsulas mm -hmm. that I've got on the map. Right, okay, you can see now um, part of the Southern Papuan Peninsula was part of um, the, the Craton, the Australian Craton, but it's been collided with by, by terrains and it's built up much more of the peninsula. All of that northern part of New Guinea is um, terrains that are coming. In fact, some, one, of, one of the papers I was reading said that there were at least 32 terrains that had collided create, to create northern New Guinea, at least 32. And wow. some of them 
were composite terrains, which suggests that they've had little collisions elsewhere before they've hit New Guinea. Mm. And it's not over because the Huon Peninsula there is a more recent collision. There are mountain ranges in the north of New Guinea, which are from more recent collisions as here you have the you have the you've had the big shunt in the traffic and then all the other cars are over the next 30 seconds to a minute banging into the backs of the cars that have stopped in front of them and sure. that's what you're getting here you know everything's slowed down and they're still colliding and sure. eventually new britain new ireland and bougainville they could come in and fold in and collide as well we're mm. not going to see it of course yeah. but you know, this is all still in motion and you can see that it's an active area because of the, the belts of volcanoes. Sure. And um, the, the, the interesting thing about this is that um, animals are distributed based on their origins. Or, of course, they can hop off, you know, if, if, um, if two plates collide, they can hop off and start to live in the other, on the other piece of land. That, that wasn't part of their origins, but to a degree, you, if you look at the, the, the snake fauna of southern New Guinea, it's very similar to northern Australia, taipans, yes. black snakes, uh, brown snakes, um, uh, a lot of the pythons, green tree pythons, scrub pythons, well scrub pythons are through the whole lot, um, but, and green tree pythons, but carpet pythons are only in the south. There's a lot of similarity, some of the, the small obscure lapids like um, uh, Farina tristis, or the small, the little the Australian small-eyed snakes, Cryptophis. They are really Australian snakes that are found in the south. The south. They're not found any further north. When, if you go to the north of New Guinea, over that mountain range, you will not find taipans. You will not find black snakes. Hmm. Um, you will find death adders, but it does limit the distribution. And so, some of the some of the um, uh, New Guinea snakes that are, are, are not related to the Australian snakes are found to the north and only come into the south a little bit because of their origins. And I find all this really fascinating. It's, yeah. it's, it's island biogeography. So you yeah. were right. Yes, it is the vanguard of the Australian Craton, but not the whole of New Guinea. Sure. That's been formed from elsewhere. Very interesting. Yeah, that it is. is very complex. Of course, I you know i kind of simp simplified it a lot oh but yeah yeah that yeah. is that is incredibly interesting i didn't know that all of that was going on that is very complex very interesting and some of it turns some i think some of the like the fact fact peninsula is a, is really strange i think that's come round and almost gone round in a in a in a, an arc and come back up again and and hit the underside of New Guinea wow. because you just don't know where these plates are going to go. Yeah, sure. Um, you sure. know, but it is it is it is fascinating. Yeah, amazing. Um, yeah, and and while things are colliding, things are getting further apart. Um, if you see here, um, this is the Woodlark Basin, and uh, that's Woodlark Island, and that's Missima Island, um, that's uh, that's Rossell, and that's Sudest. Now, these islands are all closer together at one point, and they've all got toxic acalamus on them. But this basin is spreading apart. It's a bit like the Atlantic. It's getting wider. Mm. Um, and so Woodlock has moved a long way from the islands that it was originally closely associated with. So this is all cool stuff. And if you really want to understand distribution of snakes, you have to, you have to go back in time. And, yeah. and, and look at the papers written by the geologists and try and get your head around some of the really complex stuff. But mm. it, it is fascinating because it adds meaning to, to, to what you're looking at. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Wow. That's, that's pretty good stuff right there. That is fantastic. I'll stop sharing for a bit. Yes. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> so, okay. We got that down. Let's talk about your expedition to when you found the Antaresia. That's oh, really yeah. of interest to me. The, that Was that during the filming of one of your... Yes, it was. Yes, it was, because I made an identification error on camera. But that was the thing about Big Adventure. It stays in. You know, when I made O'Shea's Big Adventure, I said at the get-go, I want this to be real field work. I, 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 don't, I don't want to... Um, any suggestion that we're going to cheat, we're not bringing in um, hired in snakes 
um, in case we don't find what we're looking for. Yes. And a lot of the places it would be damn near impossible to do anyway. Right. But, you know, um, I, I didn't want to do any. I want my background is field work. I've been doing yeah. field work in the tropics since the, eight, the early 80s. And so that's what I want to reflect. And any 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 field herper will tell you that you do not go out and find what you're looking for every time. Sure. It's a fact of life. Sure. If you did, I think it would take the edge off it. It wouldn't be as much fun. Right. Because success and failure are two sides of the same coin. And to appreciate the one, you must taste the other. Yes. And, and, and life's like that. And you never succeed at everything all the time. Right. So I wanted to portray that. And in actual fact, um, we failed in 20% of our films to find what we'd gone looking for, but we still got films because we're finding other things. So, sure. I mean, I remember when we were going to be filming in India, the director phoned me up and he says, right, I'm at the permit office, he said, and they want to know, um, uh, they were going to let you catch three species of reptiles, um, but only three, and I've managed to get them up to 20. And they said, well, you must know which ones you're going to catch. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. Sure. <laughs> if I had the benefit of, 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 of foresight like that, I'd be betting on the GGs, you know? Yeah. So, um, that, but they'll only let you have 20. And it, so I said, all right then, rat snake, cobra, skink, gecko, agama. <laughs> and so my right. species were actually species groups right. and they went for it. So oh, I basically, I got frog, toad. <laughs> <laughs> I, I covered the whole lot. So in actual fact, I, I think I probably had less than 20 because I, I, I'd managed to sort of those big nebulous um, titles. But the point is that, that we didn't know what we were going to find. Sure. And we certainly didn't know if we were going to succeed. And fortunately, on the film that we're talking about now, where I got the Antaresia, we didn't succeed in finding what we were looking for. If you remember correctly, we we're looking for Salvador's monitor lizard. Yes, yes. Salvadori. Now that's a very poorly known animal. It was widely distributed. It's through the whole of the archipelago. Well, well the whole of New Guinea, the main island, and, and possibly on one or two of the satellite islands, but the whole of New Guinea, from the Vogelkop down to the Papuan Peninsula, it's everywhere. Um, but it's really hard to find. Yes. It lives inside trees. And um, I looked at, museum specimens and around the world there were 30 or 40 specimens in museums of Varana Salvadori but not many more than about 12 or 14 of them had actually got collection locality data mm. had actually been found and collected as a museum voucher specimen all the others had come from zoos or private collections when they died and being given to the, to the museums. And, and those sort of specimens have very limited value from a biogeographical or a systematic um, um, standpoint, because sure. without knowing where something's from, you can't really put it into your bigger picture. Sure. They're great for osteological specimens or for preserving in a jar and showing somebody what it is or anything, taxidermy, anything, they're fantastic for that. But from, from a research standpoint, they're, they're a very limited value. And we were looking for Rana Salvadori because I'd been to look for it before when I was in New Guinea the first time in 1986. Um, I was hoping to, to, um, to find Salvadori and I was in Western province and I'd got a, I'd got a, um, a, a, a hunter who was gonna take me out to look for the dragon, uh, the Australia, no, what do they call it? Um, yeah, Australia they call it. And they're frightened of it. They say it eats their dogs. Whether it does, I don't know, but, but they're quite frightened of it. Who's going to take me out? But as the time got nearer and nearer, it got harder and harder to comp contact. And when I actually went to his hut to find out where he was and when we were going to look into this, he apparently had to go and stay with his mother-in-law. So that sort of tells you which dragon was he most frightened of? <laughs> Clearly right. not the one covered in, you know, the, one, the, the scary one was the one in the, out in the, in, in the Guinea. So, so <laughs> That right. Uh, uh, one of my one of my team thought he saw one stand up and look at him over the grass and the height of the kunai grass. It had to be because um, the the panoptes the around panoptes didn't get big enough. Right. So it was sort of um, a bit of unfinished business. So I suggested this this film, 
and we put a lot of work into it. We built um, trapping cages and we covered a lot of ground. Western province, southern western province is a huge area. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's really no roads. You get about by boat and, or by aeroplane. And we were covering, we were literally flying from one location to another and then we we're working with the villagers, spreading out, going out with the hunters setting traps to catch it alive. We didn't, we weren't going to keep it. We just wanted to photograph and film it and then let it go again. And we tried everything. I'd even tried getting inside hollow trees and climbing up inside with a head torch on because <laughs> these trees are really, you get big hole, you know, hollow inside and you, you can get up into it. You can if I, you're my build anyway, put it that way. Um, <laughs> and and because the, the, the lizards, get, I mean, I was finding bat roosts and things like that, but sure. no, no bonnet to lizards. And, um, we worked and worked and worked. And one of the places we went to was Weem, which is um, on the Bensback River. And that means it's right close to the, the border with Indonesia and New Guinea. The river runs over and comes back. And there's a lot of to and fro between the people across the international border. And, you know, there, there, was, um, there was some trouble going on in Indonesia and New Guinea at the time. The OPM, which were a guerrilla unit, were operating out of New Guinea, Papua New Guinea, going over shooting at the Indonesian soldiers and coming back over the border. And there's just, sure. it's, it's just quite a bit of tension. Yes. But um, we were in some of those villages and um, we, we were getting nowhere looking for the, the monitor lizard, but I was catching other monitor lizards. I, I caught uh, Varanus dorianus, Varanus panoptes, uh, Varanus in, uh, indicus, Varanus brasinus. Yeah, I got any others, but not that one. And then we're on this airstrip, this at Weem, and this airstrip has been disused for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And it's just a, a pile of trash. And I'll show you, I, I'll share my screen again because I've got a picture of it here. Oh, great. There we go. And over to share. Okay, it's a disused airstrip. And this is down at one end and you can see there's a lot of corrugated tin. Yeah. Yes. And I was with um, Robert Sprackland, who you'll probably know from his um, giant lizard books and things like that. I mean, Robert's very respected in the, in the Varani world, but he'd not been to New Guinea before. Um, I'd got him along as a monitor specialist, as my contributor. And we were just pulling apart some of those piece, curved pieces of tin, which obviously go over a roof of an old shed that he used to keep the aircraft in when it was operational. And the first thing I found was a shed skin, quite a small shed skin, something like that long. And um, it was obviously from a python, but I couldn't tell which one. And, but it, it gave me hope to search. And I thought it was going to be an amethystine python, small amethystine python. And as we pulled the, the metal apart, a small snake dropped down. And I grabbed it and I'm going, oh yeah, look, I'm a this time Python. Now the, the cameras are rolling, they're picking me up doing this. Going, and, and Robert said, oh yeah, that's great, that's great. And I'm going, no, it isn't. I'm looking at it, no, that's not an this time Python. Now the only New Guinea Python that I've not seen in the scales, if you like, in New Guinea was at that time, the water Python, um, Fuscus. So I go, well, it must be a juvenile Fuscus. It must be a juvenile water Python. And he's going, it's the one you haven't seen. I'm going, but it ain't that either. What the hell am I holding? Wow. You know, uh, and I, I wrote the book on the snakes in New Guinea. Now, that actually can be downloaded from my research gate and academia.edu accounts free of charge as a PDF, because I put it on there. I'm, I'm writing the revision, but that was published in 1996. And there were eight python species in them because the uh, Leo python had been split up and so on, so on. But I'm, I'm going through my, in my head, I'm thinking, this isn't in my book. This isn't a New <laughs> Guinea python. And I was really puzzled. So I took it back to photograph where we we're staying and I worked it out and I did a piece to camera afterwards about what I did was I went back to, okay, I know it's a python. So I dug out some keys to pythons because I just didn't think of an Antaresia. Sure. And when I ran through some keys, it, Antaresia, well, Antaresia is in, at that point is endemic to Australia. Right. Not found outside. Well, what's he doing here? And people say, oh, well, maybe he's brought in as a pet. No, nobody takes snakes to New Guinea. As pets. <laughs> they eat them in New Guinea. Oh, right. They don't keep them as pets. Sure. Right? Um, and this is a disused airstrip. 
has been for 10 years, which from the size of the snake probably was, you know, when it, when it hatched, but it was an anteresia. Now, because I was filming, I did not have collection permits to collect museum specimens. But fortunately I had with me um, an old friend from the Papua New Guinea Museum, National Museum Papua New Guinea called Eli Bigilali, who was in charge of the collection there. Now, it's a really interesting museum and they've got a, when you go into, it's a lot of cultural uh, stuff because obviously New Guinea is well known for its cultural artifacts and there's a natural history section. And in the, the museum's like, um, think of a tire with a hollow in the middle. And that in the middle is an outdoor garden. It's not very big, mm. but they keep all sorts of things in there like tree kangaroos and, and these enormous blue pigeons, the uh, Gurari pigeons, I think they're called, massive things. They're their pride and joy. So they weren't very pleased when I put a crocodile in there and had one of their pigeons. <laughs> um, I didn't know I was gonna do that actually. But, uh, <laughs> but um, and they had some Python displays and things. So I said to Elijah, take this with you and keep it in the live collection. And when it dies, make sure you preserve it because this is really interesting. And we got the paper out. We published a paper um, in um, Herbological Review. And all the best I could do really, because I didn't have the, the specimen, was um, publish it as a range extension for um, Anteresia maculosa, which is up into Queensland was the most likely one. Here's, I'll show you the, what, it, what this, um, sorry, what this snake looked like. Oh, oh dear, oh, I don't want to do that. There you go. Those are photos I took at the time of the python. And I sent them to, um, the pictures to Dave Barker. And he said, well, yeah, it looks like almost like one of the phases that, that people have bred of maculosa, but it just doesn't look quite right. And let's face it, he sees a lot more pythons than I do. Sure. And, but there was nothing else I could actually put it, uh, officially record it as. It had to be maculosa. I can't go and record it as a new species without the specimen and so right. forth. And, and that was in 2000. And of course, um, earlier this year, it was described and it became one of the paratypes of um, Anteresia papuensis, which is really nice because I knew there was something happening there. It's taken 21 years to see it published, but I knew that that was worth hanging on to and putting into the National Museum of Papua New Guinea's collection. That so is that's, amazing. That's, that's the, uh, I'll sh come back to you now, stop sharing. There we go. And you are the fortunate owner of... Um, yeah, I, I actually have one right here. So they're probably the first one, first living specimen, specimen you've seen in 20 yes. years? Yes, absolutely, yeah. in, in 20, <laughs> 21 years. Yeah. Much larger than mine, of course. Uh, mine was half that size. And sure. I, I dare say if we'd searched high and low, we could have probably found other specimens, but sure. that wasn't what we were there for. Right. We were there for Salvadori. And this is why I'm pleased we didn't find Salvadori. Because if we had found the first and second seasons of OBA, my abbreviation for O'Shea's Big Adventure, I don't want to yes. keep saying O'Shea's Big Adventure. Yes, yes. <laughs> OBA, first, first and second seasons were half hour films, because that's what they used to do then. And then we moved on to seasons three and four, one hour specials. Now, in a half-hour film, looking for the monitor, if we'd found the monitor lizard, uh, at least 10 minutes would have been about it, walking around, filming it, doing all sorts of juggling balls and whatever. Sure. You know, it would have preoccupied the film. Yes. yes. Had we found it. Yes. And this python would probably have ended up on the cutting room floor. Yeah. It wouldn't have actually made it onto camera. I and agree. We, we, you know, we, we, it's a shame that... I don't own all the rushes for all the films because there's the species we've filmed that have never been filmed before that um, I, I, I'm never going to see the light of day. I don't even know whether all, all that material is now. And it was, you know, a lot of it never made it. And it was fantastic stuff because all done with pieces to camera, uh, explaining what it was and things like that. I, um, it, I think I, I got a scarce bridal snake in Sri Lanka when I was filming there and I showed it to Anselm de Silva. And I said, this is a scarce bridal snake. They're really rare. And he says, is it? I said, yeah, it's in your book. And I, I think it was the southernmost specimen found. It was only about the third specimen found in Sri Lanka. 
and I, I'm trying, I don't, that was a one hour special shrine because I can't remember if I managed to get that talk that into the film, but you know, it's down to the director, the editor, sure. the executive producer, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I can say, well, this is really important scientifically, but it doesn't necessarily hold that, that I will get that animal onto camera. And some of the things we found were pretty spectacular and didn't make it. So, so I was, I was relieved not to get salvaged. I won't say I didn't, I wasn't looking for it um, for the rest of the shoot, um, de deliberately not finding it. Um, sure. But um, yeah, that was one of the, one of the films we failed in, like like the one in Costa Rica for the splendid leaf frogs. We didn't find that. We, you know, we failed in a number. Um, but but that's that's how life is. And I think we found something better. Right. Oh, definitely. When we were in Brazil, we were trying to get out to Ilha Comada Grande, which is the Golden Lanceheads territory. You know, this beautiful golden snake that's more venomous than anything on the mainland because it's taking birds and has to hold. You can't do a stab and release bite and let the prey mammal run away and foot track it. It's taking birds, so it's got to hold on to them because they go flutter, 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 drop dead. Right, right. Then it can't track that. So right. um, you know, uh, well. We, were, we tried three times to get out to kill murder ground. It was just, the seas were so bad. In the end, we went by helicopter. But on one of the, when we'd given up one time, we went to Al, um, Il Alcatraz. Now, not the one in California. <laughs> there's, there's one off Sao Paulo, was, because it just means booby. It's a, it's a seabird. Yes. And this one was an island that the, um, the Brazilians used for, the Brazilian Navy used for the target practice. You've got targets painted on the big rocks and you're thinking okay has anyone told them not to shoot at it while we're here <laughs> and it turned out we'd got two days they were because the brazilian lads that i was with from institute of butantan and um uh, uh the university de sao paulo they wanted to collect the specimens of this pit viper that was on alcatraz um because they believed it to be a new species and we got these two, this two day window when the Brazilian Navy wouldn't shoot at us. And so when we arrived on, on Alcatraz, the Brazilian lads took off straight away to look for the snake. And I couldn't because the cameraman wanted, this was in the first season and he wanted to try a lipstick camera. Now that's not something you do your lips with. It's a, it looks like it's about that big. And everyone wears them now, but this is 1999. Sure. And it fits into a headband that took ages to get it set up. And it runs off a bloody great box in my backpack. And, <laughs> and, and it took like 20 minutes to, to get it set up, test it. And then he said, right, you can go. And I walked off the big rock we'd landed on, down across a bit of shingle, up around another big rock. And there were two palm trees just up the slope like that with a pile of debris and in, in, just caught in the, in the, in the axis there and I walked up behind that and with my snake stick I just went flick and all these bits fall out and a piece of uh, what looked like bamboo just slid down toppled open and this snake slid into view and it was the pit viper we were looking for we got two days I wow. found it in 10 minutes wow ah, and the Brazil they call them in on the radio we've got one <laughs> <laughs> And that was described as a new species quite some time ago. Um, that's Bothrop's Alcatraz. And I, I got one of, one of the type series for that as well, which is quite nice. So, you know, we were doing real science. It, 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 it wasn't just entertainment. Yeah, you could tell. You could tell from what I remember watching it. This has been a while now, but I watched all the episodes and yeah. you know, it was different. Now, tell me why is it you know the the production company i'm assuming owns the rights and everything no it's not that simple um to be perfectly honest i'm not altogether entirely sure who owns the rights i right. did track the rights were owned by um were owned well you see there's the first three seasons were jointly made for animal planet and your uh channel four in the uk the fourth season was just entirely Animal Planet, so everything went to them. But the rights were to some degree owned by a company called Alliance Atlantis. Um, and all they ever did with regards to OBA was produce this little post, A3, A4 poster, which I thought, well, what's that for then? Um, I never had anything to do with them. And they went under 
and were taken out by and were bought out by another company, which also disappeared and was bought out by another company. And I, 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 I heard that this other company was somewhere down in the, the Midwest and they owned the rights and they probably didn't even know they got them. Um, but do they own the rights? Because Brian Bush, who is one of the most friendly and entertaining Australian herpetologists you can ever hope to meet in Western Australia, Brian Bush is great. If you saw the Pilbara Cobra film I did with him, he was, he was a laugh a minute and he's just great, great company in the field. And he did a very naughty thing. Um, all the contributors get a copy of the film and Brian put it on YouTube. Now, I haven't done that. I can put clips up. I can put a 30 second clip up or something like that on a show reel, but I can't, even I can't put the whole film up. But Brian put it up and I thought, oops, let's see what happens. And a lot of people watched it and then eventually Discovery must have found it. And I, I, I haven't spoken to him, but I think it says, that if you go and look for it, that it's had a takedown order. So that would suggest that Discovery own the rights. Maybe they have recovered the rights. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's, I don't have them. <laughs> wow. if, I, if I had the rights, there'd be DVDs. Because there are two questions I'm asked most often about OBA. One is, where can I get they, people used to say, where can I get them on VHS? Sure, that shows sure. how long ago we <laughs> yes. took. Where can I get them on DVD? Where can I get them on, on, a, on a, a thumb drive? Um, you know, so as time goes on. And the other one is, when are you going to make some more? And yeah, I'm open to, I'm, I've been talking to um, one of my old directors, who's now an um, executive producer, and I've spoken to a number of the old crowd, who I'm still in touch with from two decades ago. And we've got some ideas and yes, I mean, I, I've obviously got other commitments now, like my university professorship and teaching students and my research and writing and book deadlines and things like that. Um, but I would certainly be open to, to doing some more or, or what I'd like to do is go back to some of the films and see if things have improved. Yes. or got worse i mean what is the situation with brown tree snakes on guam now you know everybody's taking their eye off that and they're all everybody's working on pythons in florida right, what's the situation right. with the brown tree snakes on guam there's any number of stories that came out of big adventure um and and some that we couldn't make then at the time because they were war zones or whatever you know we, sure. we used to lose a couple of films every we used to plan about three or four more films than we could actually make mm. we knew that we would lose one or two. We, we lost one on Fiji because of a, a coup. We lost one in the Solomon Islands because of a civil war. We lost one in Honduras because of a hurricane. And we were due to be looking for McMahon's Viper on the Afghan-Pakistan border. And then 9-11 happened. Wow. So we didn't even bother checking with the Foreign Office if that, if that was a no-go area. We just assumed. Um, <laughs> No, I was didn't want to go right after 9-11 to Afghanistan. No, no definitely. No, but not. but um, you know, there's things I'd love to do now. There's films I'd love to do. I mean, obviously, I'd like to go and look for Urukukawidis in, in Iran, you know, things like that. Who knows? And there's places I'd like to go, like Socotra, which is a Yemeni island halfway to Somalia. Mm, yes, yes. And it's, it's not big on snakes. Right. But some, but there's some burrowings. Uh, there are a couple of endemic colubrids. Well, one's a lamprophid, one's a colubri. There are a bunch of leptotiflopids, the thread snakes. There are stories of a uh, cobra. But um, yeah, could investigate that. But for, for geckos and skinks, it's out of this world. You know, there are 10 species of hemidactylus, house geckos, we call them. And they're not, they're half toe geckos. A lot, most of them don't live in houses. It's just because whenever you go somewhere in the tropics, or they've got, I mean, there's five species that always you find Frenatus, Garnotti, um, Platyurus, the fat tail, flat tail, um, uh, Mabui, and oh, what's the other one? Turkicus um, from, from Europe. And all of those are in the US. They're all in Florida. Sure. But we associate them with houses because right. the ones that are, live around people tend to be the ones that get translocated but uh most of them are forest dwellers and things like that 
Right. And there are 10 species on um, Socotrana, seven are endemic. And then you've got the dragon tree geckos, which are only found there, two species, an endemic genus. So there's an awful lot of other, you see, one of the things about a big, big adventure that I, that I also, one of the things I, I, I wanted to set in stone at the time is it doesn't have to be big or dangerous to be interesting. Yes. A lot of small species are very, very interesting. You just have to look at them a bit more closely. Sure. And I made a film about green blooded skinks in New Guinea. Right, uh, I remember that. Their blood, they bleed green. They're pretty, that's pretty alien. Yes. And I, I thought, I thought that it was um, anti-predator because it would make them take, because it's, it's a, there was some work done by Alan Greer and a guy called Raises in 1968. And they published a paper on the blood of these Prasnahema um, skinks. And there's five species and none of them look alike. The only thing they have in common is they've got green blood. And um, they analyzed the blood and they, they said, it's a Billy Verdin pigment. Now that's what you've got in your gallbladder. Um, and it makes it bitter if you're sick and you've got bile, that's that taste. And you, so the natural assumption is that it's, it makes them taste bitter and it would be anti-predator. Yes, that makes perfect sense. First time you think of it. Um, Greer and Raises, that was in 1968. And they said, the blood cannot be analyzed anymore because you'd need so much of it to do any analysis. Well, today that isn't the case. For sure. You know? um, and, and reptilian blood, contains a lot more DNA than mammalian blood. And it's, so you could do a lot more with a lot less. So um, certainly that they, 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 you, they, you could work on them. But I went into that film thinking that they tasted bitter. And so when we had one throw its tail in a bag, um, I ate half the tail, gave the other half to Chris Austin <laughs> um, a contributor who's also worked on green blooded skinks. He's, he's described some, no, he, has, he works a lot on skinks in New Guinea. He hasn't described any prasnahemas yet. But yeah, and we both ate a piece of this lizard's tail. Well, like, it wasn't going to, it didn't, it wasn't going to get it back, was it? Uh, <laughs> stick it back on with super glue. And I can't say that it tasted bitter. But through that film, I went through a, a Saul on the road to Damascus epiphany. I realized I was completely wrong. It's anti-parasite. Ah, okay. There are five human malarias. There used to be four. There's now a fifth one, a simian one that's come over from monkeys. We're rather good at catching things from monkeys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, but there are 30 or 40 or 50 lizard malarias. Wow. And they'd be deb debilitating. But the malarial merozoites, the little parasites, can't survive in the blood with the biliverdin pigment. That, that is the current theory, that it's antiparasite, which is a great thing for a lizard living in an area where it could get parasitized by malaria. Sure. Um, so that was, that was me. Oh, and the reason I knew that it wasn't because it wasn't because I'd eaten a tail that I realized that it wasn't um, anti-predator. And one village at a place called non Nondugal, or was it Kegasugal? It doesn't really matter, but it's up on Mount Wilhelm, right in the, in the highlands of New Guinea. I went to this village and they got all these cassowina trees down at the bottom, which looked like they'd be good for Prasnahima. And I said, um, have you seen, I showed them a picture, have you seen these? Was, oh yes, yes. They used to live all in those trees, but the birds ate them all. Well, Hmm. I don't think birds, and I'm not an ornithologist, I could be corrected, but I don't think your average bird has taste buds. When they eat something, they bolt it back. They're not going to go, mm, mm, nice piece of steak, isn't it? They're not going to taste it like, they're not masticating it like a, a mammal. Would. Right, right. They, and, and it gets broken down in the gizzard, so they're not going to get to taste it. And clearly they were bolting back lizards like they were going out of fashion. So hmm. it ain't anti Predator, because their predator is a bird. Mm -hmm. Doesn't care what they taste like. Right. So that was quite an interesting. And of course, I made a film about um, luminous lizards in Trinidad. And I mean, in that film, I caught a big terciopello that was asleep on a bank. It was curled up when I came past it. And I was talking the grab stick and it went absolutely ape 
and it was all wet and slippery. And I thought, I'm going to fall down here with this snake on top of me. <laughs> you know, this is Bothrop's Asper. Sure. But I mean, he only gets a little bit of a part in the film because the film's about these luminous lizards that hadn't been seen since 1938 and glowed in the dark. And, right. you know, it's a lizard three inches long and it can carry a film. Yeah. And, and it's all about, they are interesting. Yeah, it is right. not necessary to be big or dangerous to be interesting. I agree. I agree. Yeah, all, it seems like the, the content of all of your programs was, it was just all the obscure things that everyone just kind of skips over because it's not the big dramatic. Yeah, I did know. do Komodo dragons. I did King Cobras. I did sure, sure. Uh, green anacondas. And, and you know, I, I, caught, I caught a lot of them. I caught, I've caught, how many anacondas have I caught now? Close on 40 green anacondas up to um 18 foot and, and 11 and a half stone which you just it's 176 pounds, about 28 pound heavier than than me so sure. big 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 females yeah i'm i'm not caught as many as as jesus of course mr anaconda himself jesus rivas yeah, yeah that's 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 his title but um yeah um yes i did make films about the big and dangerous because the, and i make Things like Russell's vipers um, in in Sri Lanka that, that are responsible for so many deaths because snake bites something I've been involved in working on over a number of years in New Guinea and Sri Lanka in in most recently I was in Myanmar doing snake bite research catching the the eastern Russell's vipers um, and they are really really wild ones are those a, a, a handful um, yeah I wonder if I can find that picture to share for you in a minute. Um, yeah, but you know, the, like the, those big animals, that makes the producers happy, of course, right? And that's, that's, that yes. provides a lot of the excitement. But I yeah. never see anybody focusing on all of those, like, all that stuff that you just listed out. Yeah. Nobody talks about it, even to this day. Those animals um, are widely and forgotten. Yet, and yet you'll you know? find a lot of, a, a, a lot of private herpers that have begun to specialize a lot of them do specialize in small stuff. You need less space to keep it. They start to realize the fascination of some of these smaller animals. Sure. You know, and, and they and the more they look at them, the more interested they become. Yeah. You know, um, and, and things like Ligodactylus that people keep. Felsumas aren't exactly large. Yeah, right. You no. Know, right. Um, let me see if I can find this for you. Well, I'll tell you first. Um, when I was I was in Myanmar working with Oxford University and University of Adelaide. And my purpose was to go and catch Naja Kuthia, Naja Mandalayensis, various Trimerosaurus and Deboya Siamensis for antivenom production, because they have labs in Myanmar where they make antivenoms. And so I was bringing, I was going to get animals from specific named localities. And obviously then they can look to see if there's any venom, venom variation geographically with differences in prey and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I was also working with um, Gunther Kohler from the Senckenberg uh, Museum in, in uh, Frankfurt. And he was doing some general herb collecting. And so we were buddying up in the field, you know, so I was looking, because I mean, when I'm working on highly venomous snakes for snake bite work, I can't walk past a non-venomous snake and not take an interest or, you know, sure. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm, it's, I'm too dyed in, in the wall to, to yes. ignore them and right. scurrying around for skinks, even though I'm supposed to be there for taipans if I'm in New Guinea, I, sure. I can't help myself. So, <laughs> um, so we ended up, most, most of the stuff ended up in my hotel room. <laughs> when we're in Yangon, which is, the, it used to be the capital, it's not now, that's Nipidor now, it's further north. When we're in Yangon, which is the old Rangoon. Um, well, when we stayed in hotels, we didn't tell people what we were doing. One of the Thai, one of the one of the my, the Burmese girls, one of the students, would, would she was asked what we were doing, and she told them we were bird watchers, which is a little odd because we hadn't got a set of binoculars between us. We were walking around <laughs> with snake hooks, yeah. so it's very. Um, but this the, the one hotel when we were back in Yangon, and I was doing a lot of photography before we took the venomous stuff up to um, to the labs. Um, I'd got a big sign on my door, no room service. Um, and I'm sure other people do the same thing. Yeah. And they were curious to know what I was doing. They, when they come to knock the door, they're looking, craning, you know, to see what, I don't want them to come in. <laughs> and um, the funny thing was that 
They obviously went away and Googled me because I went downstairs the one morning and all the young staff in the hotel stood to attention. <laughs> like one, about five or six of them in the, in the foyer and they stopped what they were doing. They all stood to attention and they practically bowed. They Googled me. So I oh, thought, wow. well, the cat's out of the bag now, isn't it? Really? <laughs> but you're still not doing room service. And this is why, hang on, here we go. Okay, does that, <laughs> does that look familiar? Perfect. <laughs> and these two, these two here, um, these are um, Trimerosaurus alba labris from two different locations. And these were these boxes under the sink here, you see, they weren't actually up on the wall. Um, and then these are really handy butterfly things we use for the lizards and small snakes sure somebody said they look like two black cats looking into the bath um, <laughs> kind of yes <laughs> they're actually bags of naja mandalayensis and the important thing about this bathroom is when you go in there at night um you always switch the light on you don't fumble around the darkness oh uh, yes but this will also resonate <laughs> Well, they were thirsty, they were mucky, they they, they deserved um, a good clean, so they got one. Yeah, yes. and, that, and that room got a good cleaning after you checked yes. out. Well, it, uh, yes, yes, <laughs> and I double counted everything, because the one time I was counting the the um, pit vipers, and um, in the one box, I counted 15 instead of 16, uh -oh. and I turned the place upside down you know, trying to find it. And then I went, I can't, I can't believe it. I went back and I counted it again. I just miscounted. Oh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, that was a worrying time. I don't want to leave something. So I'm scrupulously careful, you see. Yes. But, um, yes. Yeah. If anyone's going to get bit, it's got to be me, not some some innocent person. So. No, I agree. I agree. But um, yeah, that was, uh, <laughs> I should think a few people have got photographs of their bars. If they haven't photographed, their bathrooms when they've been in herping out herping maybe it's time they should <laughs> i remember photographing um a sonoran coral snake in in the in a bath in um down near the mexican border in a in a motel and of course they hide their heads all the time and so what i did was i built a set in the bath put the plug hole in plug in obviously sure sure and i needed light to be able to focus but I didn't want to have so much light that it, it hit its head. So I got a mini mag light and took the top off. So you got that little candle and yeah. just through just enough light. So I got in the bath and got the snake. I got some really great. Oh, I can imagine. That's bath, a nice you know. background. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a nice bit of a little... set. And, it, and, yeah. and it, I knew it couldn't get anywhere. When I, when I was um, on Komodo, I used to have, um, it's an Aussie sleeping system. It's basically the size of a sleeping bag. And it's got a dome you put these poles through and it's like a small tent but it's all mosquito nets and um i got that for doing my photography and i would basically get in there with the set materials with the bags of snakes with um my cameras and my film and because i was shooting film back then and and all the batteries so so i didn't have to come out and i'd get in there and have a big photo session and i'd, I'd caught a spitting cobra um on rinka in the Komodo Islands, uh, Naja Sputatrix. And I wanted to photograph this and I wanted to do it carefully. So while the crew had gone for their lunch, I am in the dome <laughs> photographing this spitting cobra, which couldn't go, if it ran, it just went behind me and come back around and I'd get it settled again. You take your time, you take your time, you take your time. And I got it hooding at me and then at the camera. And then suddenly it went and looked up just as the dome started to shake. And I thought it was the cameraman come back and I turn around and I said, bugger off. And it was a Komodo dragon. Wow. It had got hold of the dome and it was in his mouth and it was trying to get in with us. <laughs> oh. And what it was, it was in, it was the cobra. I think it was interesting more than me, but I've got a cobra with, and a cobra is the, what's going on. And I've got this dragon and I said, clear off. And he did. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> but it was the last, I mean, okay, I was on Komodo, I should have thought about that, but but it was the last thing I thought I'd, you know, 
I, it, you know, it's the kind of thing that your your friends come and do when you concert. Sure, of course. You know, and it wasn't my friends. It was it was a wretched <laughs> dragon. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, well, Mark, I know you're a really busy guy. I am as well. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but this was amazing. I'd love to talk to you again sometime. You have lots of interesting stories. Just amazing. I also have been to West Papua. I've been to Moto, I've been to many places, and I have a lot more travel in me as well. I retired last year, so my wife and I, we live in Thailand about nine months out of the year, and then for about three months, we come back here to the U.S., do some expos, do some reptile things, and then we head back again. And we're just waiting for the pandemic to allow us to cross some borders and, and do some more adventures and things. But amazing to talk to you. I love the stories. I, you broke it down exactly how a professor I expected would. Um, <laughs> I learned a lot today as well, but it, it, just amazing. It's such an honor to have you on and um, hope we can do it again sometime. And if you ever want to if you need help on some project or an expedition or whatever, I am not a scientist by any means, but I have, you know, some skills as far as field herping. And if you ever need some help, feel free to call upon me. We'll be there. Thanks, Dan. It's been a pleasure for me also. Thank awesome. you very much. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day and I will be in touch at some point in the future. Okie doke. I'll wait All to right. hear from you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.